In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, me and my co-host Richard Stamen, we are going to wrap up the NBA Combine. The 2023 NBA Combine is over. We're we'll talking about winners, losers, who played well. Obviously, we are still in the gym. There's a pro day behind us. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I am your host, Rafael Barlow, Director of Scouting for NBA Big Board, and my co-host, Richard Stamen, Mr. Mavs Draft. Everybody in the Twitter draft, draft Twitter community knows Richard. Let's get right into your first combine experience. Sum it up for me. It was so much different from everything you see on TV where it's not just the scrimmage, right? The scrimmage is actually barely any of it. I think that was the last part of it for me that really, like it was the least relevant part for me, I think most of it. You're meeting a lot of different people. I think that's a big thing that goes on behind the scenes. The same way Summer League, everyone's talking. I mean, front offices are talking here. I mean, things, stories broke while we were here from people that were here with people that were here. And then on top of that, like behind us, the pro day that's going on, you know, just the workouts, things like that. You get to see guys privately train in a just different environment than you could have generally in, just by going to a game or even a private workout. It's just vastly different. Yeah, it's way better than Summer League. Summer League used to be like this years ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago. I mean, there was obviously fans could come, but now Summer League is just, it's, it's just crazy. I mean, it's a big event, but for the NBA Combine, what a lot of people don't know is Agents aren't even allowed to come in here. The only people that are allowed in this arena right now are the players, NBA team personnel, and media. And right now, we're the last two media guys left. I know for me, it's been it's been a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot of work. I probably left the arena at 12:30 a.m. every night, and I probably wake up at six uh, doing all the podcasts, writing. And the cool thing about being here late is, I mean, we may see in the background in a few minutes, there's a group from Clutch that comes in and works out about 11 o'clock every night. And I, I, I leave you on a little secret. Derek Lively can really shoot the ball. I've peeked into some of his workouts and, and, and he can really shoot the ball. So he's gonna be able to surprise some people. All right, let's talk about, first of all, let's get your lottery reaction. We recorded the episode, someone's jacked my memory card, and we had to do another one. But real quick, like who is, or who was the biggest winner on the lottery? I'm not even gonna count the Spurs because obviously they won the lottery physically and they got Victor Wembanyama. I think it was really, there are a few teams. The Dallas Mavericks, they got very lucky with no change really outside of the Pistons, uh, who are very clearly the losers of the lottery. You know, worst worst case scenario happened, and we just no, talked to two Piston scouts down there, and and they're they're down bad. <laughs> I'm like, it's hard, and I think the winners though would be Portland because now they can either take one of the most polished wings in the draft, they could take the guard of the future if Damian Lillard moves on, or they could trade the pick and get an absolute steal of a return, especially if Scoot Henderson is there. I think doesn't really matter if him or Miller are there, but. I think it's going to be a massive return to really keep Damian Lillard. You can make a big push. You can get a star with that pick. So they, they benefited a lot from moving up. Let's talk about the news that broke today. Jonathan Gavoni tweeted out that Brandon Miller hasn't interviewed well and he's out of shape. What's your first thought about that? That doesn't seem right. Uh, by all accounts, Brandon Miller has always been very uh, charismatic, you know, just good with the media, good with the interviewing. I, I can't imagine it would be much different with an NBA team, right? And it just doesn't match what we've heard for the last six months of him playing. Yeah, man, I didn't like it at all. And not because I'm a, a Brandon Miller fan. I actually met him today for the first time. I just don't like it because whether it's smokescreen or not, I just think 
it, it's just a bad look to try to put out that negative information to hurt somebody's draft stock and whether it's maybe it's a team feeding it to them but if a team came to me and said hey we want you to say such and such has played poorly I'm not gonna say it and maybe I'm just not cut out to be that type of media person I mean I, I don't know like I just don't I just don't like it and I had a chance to meet Brandon and actually before the story broke I had heard from somebody that is very very close to the situation that Brandon was sick so if he's out of shape it's because he hadn't worked out he was sick and he hadn't even been cleared to to work out so I heard the context of it like before everything happened but what was weird about it was that Woj tweeted something totally different now they are connected somebody saying something good somebody saying something bad but here's something that I don't know if I should say this does Portland want Brandon Miller to fall to number three I mean I'm just connecting some dots here, if you don't mind. Uh, so for those who don't know, the new assistant GM of the Portland Trailblazers is Mike Schmitz. Let's walk back here. Mike Schmitz used to work at Draft Express not even 12 months ago with Jonathan, Jonathan Gavoni. Who knows? Could have been some smokescreen coming from Portland. That's, that's about as much as I'll say on that. Well, that's the first thought that came to mind, but... Mike, is, I, I can't see Mike doing something like that. Mike is a good dude. He is yeah. one of the guys that is, I mean, liked by everyone. I've never heard anybody say anything about Mike Schmitz. I don't think that's part of his character. So I don't know. I mean, but that's the first thing that came to my mind is, oh, yeah, there's a connection there. Portland may want him to fall to number three. But I, I just thought that was, I was crazy. So when I when I heard it, I was um, coming into the hotel, and the first person I saw, ironically, was Brandon and his agent. I said, hey, man, can I address this right now? I heard what's going on. And the agent is like, yeah, man, we can set it up right now. We can address it. But the other people in the round was like, man, we you know, when people go low, we just go high. We're not going to sit there and just deal with it or, you know, just... To me, that, that would be tough for me as a person to let somebody kind of make it look like I'm lazy in so many words and I just got to sit there and be silent about it. But who do you think should be the second pick? I, I still think it's Scoot Henderson. I, I've had him second on my board. He's in his own tier. The point guard abilities with the athleticism, the pick and roll ability, the, the jump shooting will come along. I think he's got defensive tools. All of that is too good to pass up. He's a good passer. Like I, I just think he's a he's that franchise changing point guard. He'd go number one in a good portion of the last few drafts. I think it, it's easy to overthink him. He's six two. I get it. He makes up for it in, in a lot of different ways. So, and I talked to Leaf about this. Would go number one in the past few drafts. What draft could you say he would absolutely go number one? I'll, I'll ignore 2013. That's the first one that keeps coming to mind. All right, no, all right. But so, 2014, does he go ahead of Wiggins? I mean, Wiggins was supposed let's, to be. Wiggins had Maple Jordan all over him. The hype was too real. All right, 15. 15 with Cat. He was pretty hyped up. 2016, I think there's an argument over Ben Simmons. There were a lot of knocks on him being on a bad team. If you compare, obviously, the G League Ignite wasn't around then, so it's weird. I think there's a possibility. I think he goes over Fultz. He does not go over Aiden. I mean, look, Aiden wasn't the best player in that draft, but I mean, the hype around him, seven foot, seven foot six wingspan, all that stuff. The Arizona ties. In Arizona. So does he go over Anthony Edwards? I think yes. A lot of, uh, that's the most split one, I think yes, because the shot selection, the, the whole love of the game narrative that got made up around Anthony Edwards was really making people go, well, maybe, maybe Lamella Ball is the best player. I, I think I I think yes on that. He does not go over Cade. Last year, there was no consensus one. I, I really think you can make the argument it's that he goes number one last year. He doesn't go over Zion. No. No, I skipped that for a reason. <laughs> so, yeah, I just I – don't, I don't know, man. I even feel like the Anthony Edwards stuff was smokescreen too because, I mean, Fair. they brought up that. He had it one anywhere and so on. And so I think, like, 
I shouldn't say I think. I'm almost 100% certain what is out there in the media and how NBA teams feel is, is, is totally, totally different. So I would think that Scoot, and we'll get to your answer, I think Scoot is the biggest loser from the lottery results. Yeah. He's not going to a situation where he is the clear-cut primary ball handler. And if you think about it, San Antonio would have probably been the only team Houston. clear cut. I even think in Houston, I mean, Jalen Green is going to need the ball in his hands True. more. True. Detroit wouldn't have been a great fit. Charlotte wouldn't have been a great fit. I think Indiana, I think Halliburton can play with anybody. Who, who else? Orlando, yeah, but they'd have to like. I think it works. They yeah, I, I think so. But yeah, I think he was the biggest loser because. He was talked about as being as generational as, as Vic. And after the first game in the showcase, there were talks about maybe there may be a team that likes him that can go number one because they say that he'll have the ball in his hands more. And now there's a really legit chance that he could fall to number three. Do you think that he's been penalized for kind of taking his foot off the gas in the second half of the season? 100%. Or do you think this is media-driven? Well, yes yes and no to both. I think, I think he took his foot off the gas, and it drove the gap, right? And it tightened the gap. It drove the gap from one to two, and it tightened the gap from two to three. But I think there is some media-driven stuff. There's, a, there's more. But both red. guys have Brandon Miller number two. I think it's pretty split. I mean, I, I still think Scoot is the consensus number two, right? The way I see it is, let's let's look at Charlotte, right? I actually don't think it's a bad spot. Yes, you have Terry Rozier. If him and LaMelo have been able to mesh as much as they have, I think Scoot Henderson will be able to. I, I think it'll, they'll play to each other's strengths. It might help LaMelo defensively play more off-ball, even more than he does now. But... The media-driven stuff, I, I think there's an element of it that is because it, it feels very convenient that Scoot Henderson's flaws get exposed more than Brandon Miller. I, Bra I, I, I kind of disagree with that. Well, like, how many times have you heard about Brandon Miller's layups? We, well, we, well, here's the thing. I feel like you hear more about Brandon Miller's inefficiency at the rim, but if you look at Scoot's numbers, his numbers at the rim were not great. Yeah, they might they even be out, yeah. lower. I think they're still higher, but they're yeah, they're not as impressive. Last, but against I tougher competition. Well, but there's more. I would say there's more spacing in True. the G League than True. in college basketball. True. So I, I just think like I think if Scoot, if his second half of the season was on display on ESPN two or three nights a week. I think the narrative would change there. I think a lot of the people did not watch a G League game in the second half of the season. Fair. All right, when we return, we'll talk a little bit more about this week's NBA combine. But let's talk about bird dogs. Bird dogs are the stretchy pants or shorts. They fit. They provide comfort and versatility. If you want to wear the bird dogs to a date, you can wear them to a date. You can wear them to a golf match. You can wear them to your kids' play, recital. Bird dogs are comfortable and the versatility. I mean, we talk about versatility all the time in sports. Bird dog pants or shorts are versatile because you can wear them anywhere and feel comfortable. And they're made for the guys out there with the guts and the dad bods because they're so comfortable and they look good and they fit good that you'll be confident even with your gut and your dad bod. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. And when you enter the promo code locked on NBA, they'll throw in a free customs bird dogs, Yeti style tumbler with every order. So go to birddogs.com if you want to feel comfortable and be versatile at the same time. <laughs> Big, big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. We are wrapping up a great week at the NBA Combine. It was Richard's first experience. It was my second. It actually felt like, it, for me, it felt like, even though it was my second, it felt like I've been here 
a lot and been here before. But it's it's a great event. I mean, it's something that I would say every person that aspires to cover the draft and work in the media, this is where you want to be. And if you everybody's been hitting me up, how do you get to the NBA Combine? Content, content, content. You got to put out a lot of content. You can't say, oh, I want to cover the draft, I want to be a scout, and you have no content out there. Your content is your resume. I mean, between Richard and I, if you go to our social media or our website, you're going to see years and years of content. We didn't get here by accident. And that's like something I've been hearing. I probably get like five or six messages a day of how did you get to the combine, yada, yada, yada. So that was a little nugget I just dropped right there. All right, let's talk about the games. I was working. I actually filmed a private workout with Max Lewis today. I got a private workout and interview. That should be coming out pretty soon. So I didn't get a chance to watch the games. I've seen the box score. I'll go back and watch the film. But who stood out to you in today's games? Well, first one, Ben Shepard absolutely killed it. If I'm not mistaken, he closed with, and I don't, we don't have any stat sheets, computers, anything like that in front of us. I believe he was at 25 points, 8 of 10 shooting. It was ridiculous. He was the winner of today, far and away. Second best player, and this is a guy who I know you asked just for today, but for the last couple of days, Seth Lundy. That man has shown out. He has absolutely improved his stock. He did everything that was asked of him in the role he will play in the NBA. He's a he's not a sorry, not a stretch. He's a fourth, fifth option. And he was gonna be off ball. It's gonna be, hey, you're gonna it's you know, motion offense, the ball keeps swinging, find it, you're open enough to pop and shoot it. He hit shots on the move, standstill, off the dribble, step backs, coming off screens, however you want to do it. He found a way to do it, and he did it efficiently. And on top of that, he attacked a couple closeouts, had some nice reverse layups, something he did a lot of at Penn State, a very underrated skill. His reverse layups are strong. I was really impressed. It felt exactly like what he'll do in the NBA with that role. I think it translates up. I think he's the second biggest winner, really in general, from the scrimmages this week. All right, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Ben Shepard was 8 of 10 from the floor, 3 of 5 from 3, 6 of 8 from the free throw line, 4 rebounds, 3 assists, 25 points in 19 minutes. Yeah, that's, he, that's absurd. He really team. helped himself. What's Who was another player that you feel like really helped himself? Today or just in general? Just in, in, in general, over the week. Olivia, uh, help me with the pronunciation. I think I got it, but Olivier Maxson's Prosper. Oh, Max. Oh, Max. From Marquette. Look, this is a guy who, had his three years at Marquette, had never really been seen as a shooter. He, he was, like, slowly inching towards being a shooter, but it was never sustained, consistent success. The last four days that we've been here, can you even say anything negative about anything he did here? No, I mean, he ran the floor. He, I wouldn't say it was as strong as Jalen Williams' performance last year. Right. But it was a guy that got his points. He only played one day. I think he had a, they told me he had a calf injury. So that's why he, he, he didn't play today. But um, he got his points without forcing anything. It was in the yep. floor of the offense, running the floor, knocking down open shots. I thought he really helped himself. I honestly didn't have him on my board coming into into the combine, and he'll, he'll definitely be on there now. Who else do you think helped themselves? Yeah, I, I would say Jordan Walsh, even though he wasn't the most efficient in his two days. Look, he showed a lot. The length, I mean, he measured as a 7-2 wingspan, very clearly has the body to grow into it. Um, he was actually somebody who I also got to talk to today after, and I asked him, I was like, you know, your shot, you're, you have long arms. Your shot didn't succeed like it should have this year. 71, 72% from three or from the free throw line, excuse me, 20%, like 27, 28% from three. What are you doing to improve it? And he's like, you know what, for me, I'm in the gym every single day working on it, repetition, just hammering home new different ways to get up 500 makes every single day. Like, you know, he's like, you know, at the combine it's hard because you don't get a chance to really get those 500 shots even, not let alone 500 makes, but 
over the last few weeks and going forward, that's his path. But on top of that, in the play, he played really well. I, I liked what he did uh, in those games. Just found the way to impact the game. Defensively, he, I mean, even yesterday, he had at one point zero points, five rebounds, five assists, and like two steals, and he might have been the second best player in the game without even getting putting the ball in the basket. If you see me nodding my head on YouTube, it's because this was like my motivational song back in like 2011 when I first started this basketball grind. But I'm not the biggest J. Cole fan. All right, what did you think of what did you think of Brandon Pajemski? Man, the only thing that that Brandon Pajemski did to hurt his stock wasn't in his control. It was genetics. <laughs> he didn't measure well. He had a very short plus wingspan. It was still plus, which is important. But he didn't, he, I think he was plus one and a half, plus two, something like that. And that's without shoes, so that number's going to shrink even more with shoes. That hurt him. But in terms of play, really hard to dissect anything he did wrong. The advanced reads he made at Santa Clara and quick offense over defenses, through defenses, he did again through, like, just both days, every single possession, there, he was finding the right plays. Even if there were turnovers, he might have tried threading the needle a little bit too tightly. The reads just to see what was next were really strong. And on top of that, he also scored well, too. Yeah, I thought he helped himself. Did he Did he play today? I didn't see he any did. games. How did uh, he play today? He, he didn't play a ton. It was kind of the same thing, just in a very limited burst. He Look, he didn't get the ball a ton, um, probably as much as he could have. It's also partially, I mean, they, they really spaced it out for the fringe guys at the end of the combine bench to get more minutes rather than Brandon, who he was one of the main stars of the last two days. I saw Turquavion had a, a, a much, much better second day than he had the first day. How, how did he look to you? It was still the same issues were there. He made more shots than he did the last, yesterday. But overall, the whole week, the issue with Turquavion Smith has been he hasn't been making shots. I mean, we saw his shooting drills. I know one of them he was he missed, I think, five straight jumpers, including an air ball. Uh, excuse the buzzer in the background, but uh, I don't know if that's our timer but for me to, no. that I've hit like the Oscars. But, you know, with him, it, it's really just that shot making and that shot taking because he took some bad shots. It was I remember there was one possession within six seconds. He took a contested pull up three like it was a two for one and there were four minutes left in the quarter. So he's really got to prove he can't he doesn't need to make things as difficult for himself as he continuously does throughout North Carolina State and here. Everywhere he's been, he's kind of just made things harder than it needs to be, and that's what he's got to overcome. I actually sat with a, a, a team front office exec today, and he didn't have bad things to say. He, he said that we know he can make those shots, and right. he was basically saying that there are some guys that came out here and, and dropped an absolute dud. They did not even try to shoot they weren't aggressive they weren't assertive and he mentioned that it, with all the guys that are like not playing he says the second day is really the G League elite camp he says most of those guys are going to be G League guys he said very few guys that are playing on the second day are going to be drafted so he's like if you are not like really making an impact whether it's rebounding defensively or even like collapsing the defense then he's like it's going to be hard for you and he had mentioned with Traquavion he's like we know he can make shots but he's assertive and he even when he had a, a, a bad day he came back and made up for it and he said there's some guys that just had two days of just being totally yeah. totally ineffective name another player that stood out to you whether it was good or bad I, I think Sir Quavion was probably the one who I, he's dropped the most from my board. I, mm -hmm. I would say um, somebody else who I, I did like I, was Isaiah Wong, obviously. You know, I had to get that in while we were in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the one issue I had today with him, and, and I had heard, overheard a, an entire staff of teams, uh, of one team, excuse me, saying he is not passing the ball. He was scoring well for both days. I think in the first game he looked a lot more natural in his scoring. But there are two things that stick out with Isaiah for him to stick. I, obviously, I'm like his biggest supporter. I'm the president of that Isaiah <laughs> Wong Get Drafted Club. But there are two things, and I completely agree, are can he be a point guard at times? He doesn't need to be a full-time point guard. He's a score first guard. 
but can he be enough of a point guard instead of the your turn, my turn offense? And then secondly, can he actually do what he does in quick offense? Because a lot of what he does, it takes time to set up. And, and you know, in the NBA, you can't take the whole possession to get your moves off in time. You got to work quick. I mean, it's it's kind of like you know, one on one, you get three dribbles or something. You got to be able to win in that environment. Yeah, we played one on one or king of the court today. I need all my dribbles. We don't need Sh to talk about. Shout that. out to Leaf. <laughs> Leaf, Leaf can hoop. Leaf, Leaf, Leaf caught me by surprise. Leaf, Leaf's got some game. Or who was a player that you feel like really had no impact at all? It's, you know, I, I don't like saying this one because I thought I had high hopes, but just from Monday on, there really wasn't any pop. Judah Mintz, he measured really square. And, and the fact that I think you're thinking on it, do you remember much positive he did? He had a couple nice passes, I'll give him that. Mm -hmm. And I like Judah, but... The shooting didn't necessarily pop, and the passing wasn't – it didn't stand out. Yeah, I I sat next to somebody, and they were like, he just needs to go back to school. And But he, the way he worded it, which made a lot of sense to me, he's like, when you get to the second day, the combine are guys that are testing to see where they stand. More than likely, they're going to go back to school, or these are the guys that are going to be in the G League. And he said with Mintz, this is a guy that he felt like – he tested it. He sees where he needs to work on, what he needs to work on, where he's at. He's like, I just think he should go back to school. And he said, it doesn't make sense with all this NIL money. And, you know, I, I interviewed him after the game, too. I got to talk to him, not like a full-on interview. But I asked him, I'm like, so what's this been like? You know, you're playing man-to-man -man defense. <laughs> you're from Syracuse. Yeah. <laughs> they do not play man-to-man -man defense. And he told me, he's like, you know, I, I love it. Like, I, I was itching to play it. You know, I, I like it. And so that makes me wonder, you know, Syracuse's own defense, RIP to an era, but it's more than likely gone. I'm interested to see what he does. And let me, let me get into this real fast. The question that Richard asked is not a typical question at the NBA Combine Media Day. And I don't want to knock the – the guys that cover the NBA all season long and don't know the college players, but some of the worst interview questions I ever heard last year at the Combine. And it kind of made me realize, like, you know, I don't even need to go in there because it's it's like a scrum. You got a bunch of reporters fighting, and you ask a question like Richard did that, that gets the guys engaged and something that they want to talk about. And then a guy from a team will come say, hey, I heard you worked out for – such and such team. Was such and such in there? Did, did you see the coach? They're not asking the players anything draft related. And I get it. If you cover the NBA full time, you probably don't have time to watch college basketball. You may only know like the bigger names, but shout out to you for asking a Thank real you. draft related question because again, last year, I'll just say last year, I talked to a guy, he worked out for the Spurs and this writer says, did you see Manu in the building? Was Tony there? Did you see Tim? Did you get a chance to meet Pop? Those are the only questions that he was asking. And then he was so aggressive. I would ask a question. The guy would kind of tell me something, you know, some real basketball talk. And then this guy would come back in and ask a question about, did you go to the Alamo? And those are some of the questions that, that guys are getting. So big shout out to Richard and Lee for asking real, real basketball related questions. Who was the player that, that caught you by surprise this week? For me, it was Dylan Mitchell. Um, last year, for those who don't remember, I absolutely doubted Peyton Watson because for this century, since 2000, there would have been no player. Daniel Orton. With worse stats. Daniel Orton. I, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Daniel Orton. And the reason I know that, and I can't sit here and say that I'm a historian, somebody pointed it out to me last year when I was like, how does a guy average 3.4 points per game end up as a first-round pick? And they said, well, Daniel Orton did it, and I f totally forgot about that. And the difference, though, is and, – and I tried learning from this. Peyton Watson is, has found a role at the very end of the season that they can build on for next year. He's not going to be a playoff guy. But as a defender, he had some great defense against KD – a little bit longer than Dylan Mitchell, but Dylan Mitchell caught my eye. So I've been a little bit more lenient on him, trying to figure out, all right, context, trying a little bit over correction, but learn from my mistakes mostly. And Dylan Mitchell has transformed his game in a more free-flowing offense. You know, Texas didn't allow for him to do anything. One of the questions I'd asked him was, you know, the Big 12 is a gauntlet. It's 
you had talked to me about this. Uh, uh, an executive, uh, a scout, something had told you, someone had told you, how many freshman guards, how many freshmen in general, sorry, were in the Big 12 that thrived? Him and Grady Dick were the two big guys. No, Keontae. Keontae and, and Grady Dick. And Yes. Yep. And, and Keontae, sorry. Keontae and George. Then, I, I forgot about those two. Or Keontae, but, you know, it's hard to thrive as a, as a freshman in the Big 12, one of the most experienced conferences. And I asked him, and he's like, you know, it is hard. Like, you have to sacrifice so much. You don't get to showcase everything. And that's exactly what we had talked about before I asked him, because I, I just wanted his two cents on the exact thing we had talked about. But for me, it was just in terms of what we actually saw. It was maturity off and on the court. He was willing to go within the flow of the offense more naturally, though. Not just in, at Texas, it seemed like he was scared to do something because he knew if he messed up, he would be benched on an experienced team that was competing for a title. Yep. So this time we got to see him have the hit, ball in his hands more confidently was shooting off the dribble and the shooting drills he was making consecutive shots like it was a respectable shot and it was completely different from the zero threes Dylan Mitchell that we saw throughout the season I feel like if he would have shut it down yesterday <laughs> yeah he shouldn't have played today he he did not have a strong day today I, I did like that he was aggressive he was taking shots today he made a, a corner three yesterday and he shot the ball well on Monday. So I thought he really helped himself. He had some shots today that looked like, okay, the touch is a little bit concerning. The form has changed. I'm going to put him in my top 60. I hadn't had him in there. Me too. I was like, dude is like a six, seven, five. And like he is DeAndre Jordan at six, seven. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but I, I, I thought he really helped himself. Our last question, Imani Bates. What was your overall impressions about Imani Bates? He's like one of the more polarizing guys. I feel like people are absolutely off of him, or people are like, why isn't he doing this? I mean, I saw like Ball is Life made a video on, U on IG of his highlights that he, that he had from, um, I guess, the, the scrimmage, like the three on threes from Monday, and then the points that he had on on Wednesday, and the people that didn't watch are just like, oh man, he was killing. He's top ten guy. Overall, what are your thoughts on Imani Bates? I, I don't think he played well in the scrimmages. I, I really don't. I mean, he took too many forced, tough shots. He only wants to play in isolation. That's not going to be his role in the NBA. Like, he has to embrace that spot-up shooting, learn to be engaged all the time on defense, even with short arms. He's got to be out there. But the things, like, right away, he didn't test well. I mean, he had the lowest, second lowest, I think, standing vertical. Even his max vertical was very low. He's not super athletic. And honestly, I just I don't know if he scales down. Like, there's too much going on there. Some of his stuff in the interviews were very, like, me first. And that's just how his game is. And I think some of that the early hype got to his head yeah and, and and the wrong ways a lot of guys take it and you know they find they get a bump and they overcome it i i just don't know if he is one granted he's 19 things can change you're still not your full you're not yourself like you're not your full yeah. best version of yourself at 19 years old so i want to give him the benefit of the doubt but i mean he just he's got to change everything about it, the way he plays which is a huge ego challenge and i don't know if he's up for it yeah, the executive that I talked to says, you know, he's a guy that more than likely if he gets drafted, he's going to get a two-way, and you give him that time to figure it out. You know, you put him in the G League, and you just try to let him figure out if he's going to be realistic about who he is and how he can help a team. If he's not, then you didn't invest a lot of money. But I've also heard someone say that, he was in a, a team workout, and they were like, skill for skill, he was the most skilled. Yeah. It's like he has been drilled about his skill level at a young age. So they were like, skill is definitely not the question. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. It has been, I got here Monday. It is Thursday night. It is late Thursday Basically night. Basically Friday. Basically, it's Friday on the East Coast. We've, I mean, we've been here. We've been here. I, I'm telling you, I've probably been here at least 15, 16 hours a day. So I'm glad to go home. And in the next episode of the Lockdown NBA Big Board Podcast, 
you know, I'm not even going to lie to you. I don't know what we're going to talk about Monday. <laughs> I'm ready to go home, get some sleep, see my family. Big shout out to each and every listener that has made this Locked on NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. And we are...